Shall we pray? May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. When people of this and future generations look back on this time of pandemic, when it is all but past, as I'm sure it will be at some point, or at least when we have learned to live more fully with it, I wonder what the, fo the history books will say. Will they pontificate about this plague and what we've lived through? Will it be interpreted in different ways by different people depending on their background or their understanding? Will it simply be a statistical account of how many people sadly have lost their lives, have been infected, have suffered? Will there be a political slant about leadership, about international cooperation? And I wonder how long it will be until we are fully on top of COVID-19. For I'm confident that we will at some point do that. At least I hope and I pray that that is the case. I'm sure the history books will have accounts from the famous and not so famous about what it was like to live through COVID. There will be UK reviews of how our political leaders dealt with it, how medical staff coped through it, the lasting damage it did to mental and physical health, the amazing breakthroughs in the technology and the vaccinations and the techniques used to allow nations to share the whole story of lockdown. Some might argue it came from China. Others might say it was a disaster waiting to happen. Some might say, and I'm sure some will say, it was sent by God to encourage us to change our ways by becoming more international rather than more independent countries. All of these will be something for history. But we must learn from them. And we must realise that mistakes made because of lack of knowledge can never happen again. We must learn from them and move on. This morning I want to look at the prophet Joel and see what we can learn from this very short book. Only three chapters long. But I think it can teach us and inspire us in these days. I chose to have read two passages from it. One not that well known, I suspect, and the other so well known, for I'm sure it is read each year at Pentecost. In preparation for this sermon, I read a number of commentaries, four of them in fact, and what I can tell you about this book is that experts don't agree. According to my cross-section of scholars, the book was written anywhere between 850 BC right up until just, up, just around 400 BC. It was either the basis of many of the other prophets that copied its work, or it took passages from many of the other prophets into its work. Joel might have lived in or near Jerusalem. He might have been a priest or a temple prophet, or he might have been something else. You might see a pattern there, because we don't really know. There's so little information in this book that allows us to make factual statements about it. In one of the commentaries I read, I did find a quotation from John Calvin from the 16th century, that famous reformer. He wrote, As there is no certainty, it is better to leave the time in which he taught undecided, and as we shall see, it is of no great importance. Sometimes it's important to have the background or the situation being addressed by the prophet or any other biblical part, passage. But in this case, it makes no difference. Because m much of the apparent uncertainty lets us look at it with fresh eyes. How does it impact upon us? What we know, all we know, is that the word of God came to a man called Joel, who was the son of Pethuel. We know nothing more. Not a thing. We don't know when the word came to him, where the word came to him. There are a number of people called Joel in scripture, but this Joel is only found here and in one other famous passage that I've alluded to, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost. What we do know is the author experienced a great natural disaster in the land. 
a plague, as it were, of thousands and thousands and thousands of locusts that destroyed and devoured the land and the food it would produce. And sometimes it's easy to overlook the devastation, but imagine you're an agricultural society who depend on the food you grow every year to sustain and nourish you when devastation happens. We're seeing it in parts of Africa now with with the, the horrible droughts that's going on and the people struggling. But this was not caused by drought. This was caused by infestation. Locusts spreading and spreading and eating. And the prophet challenges the people to learn from this experience and not to forget it. He asked them this question, one I've asked myself a few times this last year. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. But tell them what? Are we just telling them for telling sake? That was a question I asked myself in my first reading. And as I've said, in time people will review what we are living through now and hopefully learn from past mistakes. So maybe that's what the prophet meant, that we have to learn too from that story. And the images that he uses imply, to me at least, that he was an educated man. They portray the mighty and wondrous horror of the situation. A nation has invaded my land, he wrote, a mighty army without number. It has teeth of a lion, fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving the branches white. Nothing is left. And if that was not vivid enough, later on he'd make an even more dramatic description of the swarms that block out the sunlight. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across a mountain, a large and mighty army comes. Never is such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. I don't know about you, but one of the effects of COVID-19 has to make me realise how powerless I am. We are against a microvirus that spreads and lives and causes disease and death. All the money and power in the world could not defeat this virus, at least not in the early days, when we shut ourselves off from our neighbours and our families in that first frightening lockdown, when we allowed ourselves an hour a day to walk outside. How could such a thing happen, I asked myself. And what is it, all this science and technology that we have at our disposal today, not able to do something about it now? Imagine what it was like then, two and a half thousand years or more ago, facing a swarm of locusts that darkened the day, the fear that it would bring in the resultant death and destruction that followed. And the prophet used this experience to try to bring the people back to God. To him, this was judgment in biblical terms. The call has often been the case was to repent and seek God in such times. The people are called. Repent. Come back, worship God, for his help to get through this terrible time. We too have been praying quite a lot over recent months, bringing us through this terrible time. But the prophet recognises it's not just the words, it's the heart that must change. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he rel relents from sending calamity. The prophet tells us that God's anger is not to last. That the behaviour that led to that calamity, if you turn, when you have turned away from God, that's the result. So re repent, seek his forgiveness, and he will bless you. 
I think that in all the work of the prophets, this call to repentance in the Bible, we see God forgives in the Old and New Testaments if we are truly sorry. Let the priests who minister before the Lord, we read, weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. According then to the prophet, after bleak times, which he said was the response or judgment on the people by God, God responds to fears and repentance positively. And what was true these many years ago is still true today. I like Joel. He does paint a bleak picture of plague, of locusts, but through it there is hope. This isn't the way of, for people of faith. That after the dark night of the soul, there is the dawn of the new day. And what a day and what a dawn he promised. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The people have lived through a terribly dark time. They have nothing else but God to give them hope, so they pray and they, they repent, and God responds, and the Spirit came upon them. True repentance swings open the door for the Holy Spirit to flood our lives. If people had not truly repented of their sins, then they would not have been blessed with the Spirit. God only comes to those who seek him. I stand at the door and knock. He said, he doesn't kick it in, but waits for us to open the door of our hearts for him to enter. And the result is witnessed in changed hearts and changed lives. Someone once said, and I don't know who, I copied it from somewhere, but I've lost the reference. It's always been God's desire to bring his divine presence among his people to become real and accessible to everyone. I wish I knew the context rather than just a saved quote, but it speaks to me after a time of darkness, that God wants us all to glimpse the light of hope after dark days, and God wants that light to show up God's hope as the people of God to us. I will pour out my spirit, said the prophet. Pour out, I love that. Not drip it on or dispense it according to your worth. I will pour out my spirit. He's so generous with the gift of the Spirit. And it's everyone gets the same measure. They don't, as we know, get the same gifts, but they get the same measure as it's poured out on them, and you and me too. And this outpouring of the Spirit breaks down generational barriers, young and old. We struggle to find ways of being an intergenerational church, we talk about all-age worship, but Joel tells us that the Spirit breaks down generational barriers, for the old men will dream and the young men see visions. This outpouring of the Spirit breaks down gender barriers. We can claim with justification that the Bible is very patriarchal in nature, that women are often denied the rights and responsibilities that men had in pre-Christian times and many years after Christ came. But the prophet speaks about the gift of the Spirit being offered to both men and women. And it's worth noting that Jesus spent a lot of time with women. And I don't think he ever meant them to be second-class citizens. And our church, though, it took many, many years, probably far too many years, to come round to this way of thinking, finally listen to the Spirit, 
with the ordination of women to the eldership and later to the ministry of word and sacrament. And thank God for that. It breaks down economic barriers. As the Spirit came not on the wealthy, but to the hearts that repented, so that the rich and the servants alike would be blessed. So that everyone is part of the salvation story. Joel lived through a terrible time, but from it he showed better times ahead. To me, this prophecy is a word for today. We are living through strange times indeed, but take heart, for God is with us. And we should take comfort from the word of God through the prophet Joel. And I will close with them. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen.